realizing I wasn't alone was something really important for me that I wasn't, that this wasn't a weakness, that I wasn't the only person for me. My, uh, about 25% of all people with mental health will have it onset between the ages of 18 and 24. It was, and especially beginning at college. I went away to college for the first time. I was a mess. And I remember my first week being on the phone with my parents, just crying hysterically. I was so depressed. I was so scared. And my dad, and saying to my dad, I'm the only one like this. I don't see anybody else, you know, who's in their rooms crying. He's like, of course you don't. They're all in their room crying. <laughs> and I remember, and it was a very poignant memory. And three years later, my sister went to my school and I grabbed her and I started walking her around. It was before anybody had had a chance to retreat to their room during freshman orientation. I said, I want you to look at something because I know this is going to be you later. You see that kid crying. You see that kid crying. You see that kid being led away. It's not just you. And realizing that it's not just you and that prominent voices also suffer, I think, is something that can be important. But people also have to know when it comes to mental health that it's average people, people just like them, one in five Americans. Uh, and I imagine it's a pretty similar number across the world suffer from mental illness, one in two will over the course of their life. At some point, people have to realize that it's so much more than just them, that they aren't alone and that they can and probably will overcome whatever they're going through. Welcome to the Gratitude Podcast on www.georgeandbenta.com, where you'll hear a new story each week that will inspire more gratitude in your own life. Our mission is to inspire 100,000 people to discover how to feel gratitude and live a happy life through the amazing life stories of our successful guests and their actionable tips. And now, the host of our podcast, George and Benta. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to this interesting and different episode of the Gratitude Podcast because today we have a politician here, <laughs> state representative in Pennsylvania, an author and uh, depression, anxiety sufferer going on 16 years strong. He has dedicated his career both in and outside politics towards shattering the stigma that surrounds mental illness. His name is Mike Schlossberg. Uh, I might have uh, pronounced it. No, in the you German got it. Way. You got it. And that's 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 a kick too to actually get it right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, Mike, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. We had the really cool pre-chat, and I'm really uh, happy that we got together to talk because I, I think you're doing some amazing things, well, and thank you. Uh, um, the way you do things are, is is quite refreshing for me. Like. Um, the perspective that that you gave me is uh, really beautiful, and oh, thank you. I'm really happy to to have you here. So uh, let our audience know a little bit about you and what you're doing, and uh, uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. And th first of all, thank you very much for having me. This this is an interesting one. I've never quite been on been on a podcast or done an interview that focuses very specifically on gratitude, and I think that's something. That can be a struggle if you suffer from some sort of mental illness, but that makes it all the more important to try to find and hold on to. Um, so again, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Schlossberg. Um, the brief background is I am a Pennsylvania state representative for the far, for the non-American listeners who are listening. I basically represent about 65,000 people in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, which is located in the eastern United States. I represent the city of Allentown, one of the largest cities in the state, on a little bit of a township next door. So that's my full-time job. What I do on the side when I have time, and I haven't slept since like mid to late 90s or so, is write. Um, a little background on that. As you said, I've had anxiety, you know, clinical depression, anxiety-related issues for 16, 17 years now, probably longer. That's just how long I've been diagnosed, about half my life at this point. Um, I see a therapist as needed. I take medication. And starting about three years ago, I started really talking about it on a regular basis as part of this desire to try to get more people into therapy and have them better recognize their own illness and try to break some of the stigma that surrounds mental health. As part of that, in about 2015 or so, I was having a low point at work. My wife was struggling at work and I made, I, I realized I needed more than just therapy or medication. I started thinking about writing again. And I've, I've written before. I published a book a few years ago called Tweets and Consequences. It was a nonfiction book about politicians who ruin their careers on social media. Everything I said is now wrong because everything I said not to do, the president of the United States does on a daily basis. Totally different. <laughs> but so I, I and writing, even though it even like, you know, it was nonfiction, it was something that I really enjoyed. And I started 
thinking to myself, maybe I should write again. Maybe that'll be a good outlet for me, a good therapy. And I remembered this goofy idea I had when I first started writing when I was about 20 years ago, doing something along the lines of, you know, kids wind up in a spaceship for no reason and they're not sure why. And it was just like the very breadcrumb of an idea. But I started thinking about that and thought, you know, there's a real opportunity there to make an interesting plot. If you add a few other elements, fold in some mental health challenges, because it's what I was become very loud about. It's arguably the, the calling card of my political career. And maybe I've got something interesting. So I wound up writing uh, the book is called Redemption. It comes out on June the 5th. And it's specifically about the, the one sentence summary is depression, anxiety and the end of the world. And it features 20 20 young adults, age 16 to 20, who wind up on a spaceship with no idea why. And as the book unfolds, they realize they have to save the world from a plague that's currently ravaging its way through Earth. And that's the overall plot. But I think the core of the book is about overcoming mental illness, depression, overcoming anxiety, and overcoming the struggles that every one of the characters face with a particular emphasis. And the book follows around a character named Ash. He's the main character who has clinical depression, anxiety that's kind of destroyed his life. And it's about his journey not over and not to defeat mental illness, because I don't think that's a thing, but through it and how he learns, tries to learn how to live with it and how to accept who he is and the struggles he's always going to face. Wow. I, I love the idea of um, getting ideas through to people in a, in an artistic way, like yeah. uh, in a way that captures you, like in a story like this one, something that is it's interesting and uh, from the other side having to to read something that's entertaining but it's so it's both like really helpful it's not just entertaining for instance in in romanian uh, we have um this world for entertainment uh, the word for entertainment is uh distracție it's distraction yeah. distract yourself from other things Right and, in circuses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I think this is a beautiful way of uh, being distracted, entertained, um, but also learning and developing yourself. And mm. I, I think it, it's a really good idea. Oh, so, thank you. That, and that, that was the attempt. It's, you know, I think anybody can read it, but I think anybody who's had any sort of experience, either personal or family with mental health, will, will understand it on a different level. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I was going for there. Yeah. So I, I have a curiosity and I, mm -hmm. I'm sure that our listeners, um, might have this curiosity as well. So you seem like a pretty happy guy, <laughs> like really, I know. really it's ugly. weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So how does this work together? Like how, how can you be, uh, like this, like really happy and also, uh, suffer from anxiety and depression? And I think I think this this can be very useful for for other people that might be in in a similar situation. That's and that is a great question, and it's one that I've definitely gotten before. I think every sufferer has a different answer. I always get a kick. You know, I've met I've certainly met other politicians now who also you know are kind of happy and gregarious, but also have suffered some sort of mental illness. Um, I think the answer is it sort of exists on dual tracks. It's The human mind doesn't work in a simple, ordered, and logical way. It sort of runs, you can experience multiple feelings at the same time, love and hate, uh, fear and joy. And I think you can experience happiness and sadness at the same time. I also think how you express yourself outwardly isn't necessarily reflective of who you are inside. Now I'm really lucky. My depression and my depression and anxiety are both by and large under control. They certainly spike at moments. By and large, I'm in a pretty good place right now, but it also bounces up and down in certain situations. Like as a politician, I've been in elected office in some form for like for nine years now. And I've done book interviews before. This is, we're, we're talking about a subject that I've done before that I'm used to. I'm comfortable. This is easy for me. This isn't a thing. This is fun. But that's not to say that if you put me in a situation that's brand new, that I'm not automatically going to feel like the walls are completely closing in, either in terms of anxiety or depression. 
And it's very situational in that regard as well. This is this is nothing for me. And again, this is something I really enjoy and I appreciate the opportunity. But in a different situation, I know I feel differently. And I suspect that other listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I do too. I do too. But uh, how can we tell, for instance, like, I, I think that everyone uh, has some kinds of con some kinds of uh, an anxious feelings or mm -hmm. uh, they can get depressed at times. Um, how can we tell if if it's actually a, a problem that we should look into or we should find solutions yeah. to? And there are official diagnostic criteria. The best way that I every you're right, of course, everybody gets scared. Yeah, everybody gets scared. Everybody gets, scared. <laughs> everybody gets sad. But it comes down to, I think, when somebody gets so sad for an extended period of time that they have difficulty functioning, that they can't get through their day, that they need to go home repeatedly. And again, that's not to say that somebody isn't going to have that challenge at some point in their lives. But if it happens to you over an extended period of time, if it interferes with your functioning, if you can't get through your day, then it's time to seek professional help. I think that's where the line is, where it interferes with your functioning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Like when you can do the things that you uh, need to do or you want to do, yeah, that 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 is indeed a problem. But yeah, I think, um, in in my opinion, uh, we get to that point, or yeah, we might have uh, this kind of situation since we were a child. That's another possibility, indeed. Um, yeah. But I think that we can do things to to make sure that we don't get to that point, or if we are in that point, uh, we can get uh, better and we can find more more happiness. And this, of course, I believe that we can do uh, with and through gratitude. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what has been your experience with gratitude? It keeps it keeps you grounded. And, it, and it, like I said, when we were talking before this, this is appropriate because that's something I force myself to try to look at in some of my more down moments. Because the truth is that it, depression is such a funny thing. I mean, when I compare myself to others and think of all that I should be grateful for, you really get hard on yourself and you wonder how on earth can I feel this way? Given everything that I have, I am so lucky. I have... I have a wonderful full-time job. I can write on the side. I'm lucky enough that some people want to read and hear what I have to say. I'm married. I have two wonderful kids. I'm in good physical health. And I try to make myself be grateful for all that I have. But that's where it can also be a problem. Because when you say to yourself, how on earth can I feel depressed and struggle to get through the day sometimes when there are so many people that have it so much worse Gratitude sort of turns into a double-edged sword, and that's a real challenge, I think, for anybody who tries to use gratitude, as I do, as a coping mechanism for depression. Yeah, I totally agree, because when we uh, try to enforce it like this, like the idea of you should be grateful because mm -hmm. all of those amazing things are are happening in your life, I don't think it works that way. Like, you can't force it. You can You can try to... Um, to use different techniques that that work, um, but to, to force it like this, it might go to to the other uh, to the other edge of the sword. Yeah. As you were saying, to to feel guilty that you you're blessed and others aren't, or that you even though you're blessed, you're you're not appreciating what you have as much as you mm -hmm. should do. And I think this is a, this is a problem that um, that has to do with education, like with how parents uh, educate us, or uh, us as parents might educate our kids. Um, because if we if we want to force it upon upon uh, children, I, I don't really think it works. Like it's best to, to have an example, a positive example of someone that is grateful and of us being grateful. I think this is the best way to learn, to, to see other people that are living with gratitude. Yeah. And also there are, of course, all kinds of techniques. And uh, I think like w one of those is um, actually, <laughs> it's counterintuitive, uh, but it's uh, looking at things that are worse 
and uh, getting perspective. Yeah. Like, like I, I don't know if you've uh, read uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, no. From, uh, Victor Frankl. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great book and uh, I definitely recommend it. It's about uh, an Austrian um, uh, psychiatrist, I think, uh, that has been in the um, concentration camps in the World War. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he talks a lot about what was going on on the inside when he was in those uh, uh, situations. And just reading that and understanding uh, the situation in which we are and getting that perspective, that, that is, is, is a very powerful way of uh, getting gratitude and of seeing our life in, in a different way. But I totally agree that forcing it like this can, can really have a, a negative impact rather than a positive one. Sounds like an interesting book, especially gratitude talking about somebody who was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, he wasn't actually talking uh, about uh, gratitude, but the fact that we... Uh, we can see when we when we read the book, we can see the perspective of what life was for him, for another person, and how life is for us. It's it's really that that perspective that makes us feel grateful really mm-hmm. easily and see that we are in a much better situation. And it is thanks to people like him that uh, made some sacrifices during that uh, period in time. But. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's let's get a little bit back to uh, to to gratitude and your own experience with uh, with gratitude. Like, um, if you could go back in time, let's say uh, ten years ago, twenty years ago, uh, what would you tell your younger self about gratitude? Part of depression, especially when either untreated or before you get treatment is your ways of thinking get completely broken. You drive yourself into these spirals of terrible negative thoughts about how worthless you are and how everything is terrible and nobody really loves you and all of that. So you just sort of spiral down and down and down. If I could have, I would have gone back and said to myself, there is so much in your life to be genuinely grateful for and to also try to gain some comparative perspective. I, as a kid, and I've said this repeatedly, you know, I, I represent a good chunk of my constituents are impoverished or they don't have access to health care that they need, that they deserve, that I do, that my wife and my family does. I would have said to myself, what you're going through is OK. You don't have to feel guilty about it. But compared to the situation that so many others find themselves in, be grateful for all that you have. And for the opportunity to get better and be grateful for the struggles. Uh, I wrote Redemption during one of the most depressed period of my adult life. And it made me a better representative. It made me a better person, I think. I, as a result of my depression and coming out with it, have been able to make a much more positive impact on the lives of my constituents than I would have if I didn't. So I would say to myself, Find gratitude in the struggle and be grateful for the experiences because as much pain as they will bring, as much heartache as they will bring, it will make you a better person and don't run away from those struggles. Hmm. This this is really good. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm hoping that it will reach the people that it, need, it yeah. needs to, to reach because... Um, I, I always like to, to to ask this question because it's it's a way of uh, never thought of it that out, way. That was interesting. Yeah, it's a way of handing out knowledge, like mm-hmm. what what I I would advise people to do so they won't make, let's say, quote unquote, my mistakes. Yeah, um, but it, it, we don't need to to do that to like uh, make sure that nobody makes any mistakes, but they can improve faster thanks to our experience and i think this is this is quite great but uh i think another another important part of what you just said is that writing was very helpful for you mm-hmm. uh and it's an interesting way of uh of uh 
making sense of the situation and of um, getting to gratitude because in the in the creative process you you get to express your feelings right like mm -hmm. how does it work for you uh, i put a lot of myself into the main character i put a lot of my wife into the main female character but i tried to also I guess in a sense, the book did indirectly answer that last question because I tried to go backwards, remember where I was at the start of this journey. The main character is 20 years old, I'm 35 now. And I tried to have him learn some of the lessons that I'm still trying to learn today. So I used the book, hopefully to impart some knowledge onto its readers and more than anything else to show people that they weren't alone. And then it, it was interesting, too, because as I wrote it, you know, obviously life continues to go up and down. I would try to remind myself of the lessons that the character learned, which are in reality lessons that I think I and others in my situation have learned. So I tried to use it that way. Hmm. I, I love it. I, I think it's it's a great way of doing this. And I ho I'm hoping that maybe uh, it will inspire some of our our listeners either to to write themselves and to find a creative way of expressing yeah. um or of course to to read your book and to see uh to go through the journey and in the journey with you for uh, instance i I, I have uh um i've done this myself like uh a few years ago i was writing lyrics poetry Mm -hmm. um, and that was really helpful in expressing my feelings and in not getting stuck in them. And that was uh, something that I, I just remembered when we were talking. Yeah. But um, I think another uh, part about what you what, what you were saying is is really interesting. So, like you, there are many people that seem to have like the perfect life on on the exterior and they they should be happy and they shouldn't be unhappy at all or they shouldn't be depressed in or, theory yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly uh but they are and uh why do you think uh that that is and what what can we do about it part of it again the human mind is fascinating i think part of depression we know that depression and mental illness in general has a very strong genetic biological component. Um, it enables some people to live the most miserable life in the world and still be happy. And it makes some people who have theoretically perfect lives still leak pain every single day. So we know biology has a strong component to it. I also think, you know, you've got a lot of like overachiever type A personalities, people bluntly like me who will seem very happy from the outside because that's how they have to do. And again, by and large, I am pretty happy and pretty lucky, but still feel that pain on a regular basis and are just better able to hide it. Now that pain can come from any number of sources, past trauma, difficult family upbringing, um, bullying. And I, I worry, I really worry about today's youth um, because of these, because of because of technology and our over dependence on it and social media. It's something I write a lot about uh, on my blog. And the, the fact that there's so much pain in this world and thanks to social media and technology, we're all so much better connected to it. Um, so that's, uh, I worry about that. And I say that I think all of those things are really going to give a big rise to an increase in mental health challenges. And all of us are going to have to better learn resilience and be better able to give people the help that they need. Yeah. I think that the, today, like so many people are in this situation, uh, living the, the lives, like the perfect lives and struggling on the inside. Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be really hard to, uh, to find someone to talk to about this because yeah. you because of this attitude again like you should be grateful you should be happy with your life and um i'm hoping that one of the things that uh, the this podcast is is doing is actually helping people see that they're not alone and uh they're not yeah. struggling not, not the only one struggling with this and 
um, that it's actually something normal, like something that uh, other people struggle with and that can that can uh, have solutions. Like it's it's something that uh, is fixable and is mm-hmm. um, it can get better and better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's realizing, realizing I wasn't alone was something really important for me that I wasn't, that this wasn't a weakness that I wasn't the only person for me. My uh, about 25% of all people with mental health will have it onset between the ages of 18 and 24. It was and especially beginning at college. I went away to college for the first time. I was a mess. And I remember my first week being on the phone with my parents, just crying hysterically. I was so depressed. I was so scared. And my dad and saying to my dad, I'm the only one like this. I don't see anybody else, you know, who's in their rooms crying. He's like, of course you don't. They're all in their room crying. (laughs) And I remember, and it was a very poignant memory. And three years later, my sister went to my school and I grabbed her and I started walking her around. It was before anybody had had a chance to retreat to their room during freshman orientation. I said, I want you to look at something because I know this is going to be you later. See that kid crying. You see that kid crying. You see that kid being led away. It's not just you. And realizing that it's not just you and that prominent voices also suffer, I think is something that can be important. But people also have to know when it comes to mental health that it's average people, people just like them, one in five Americans. Uh, and I imagine it's a pretty similar number across the world suffer from mental illness, one in two will over the course of their life at some point. People have to realize that it's so much more than just them, that they aren't alone and that they can and probably will overcome whatever they're going through. Exactly. And of course, if they acknowledge it and if they do something about it, because I, I was thinking about, uh, I'm not sure if you know about Avicii, uh, the famous DJ Avicii. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, he completed suicide recently, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's a, he's about my age, mm-hmm. and uh, it was really I I'm not sure if 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 it was suicide. Like I I think it's it's just rumors uh, okay. at this point because uh, his family didn't uh, say that it it is right. finally. I'm sure that it wouldn't be easy for them to say that it was. But however, um, mm-hmm. the thing is that even though he's like hugely successful uh he was hugely successful and everything seemed to be perfect from the outside when you put yourself in his shoes and understand his situation and um his in- internal struggle uh you might get to understand better how how it might have been for him and we we always look at other people and we we think that they have the perfect life and everything is great on the outside and on the inside as well and we we feel bad about ourselves and this is this is what i wanted to to get to like um we all have these kinds of struggles and i believe even the the greatest uh, the greatest people on earth have them and the power lies in in inside of us like in what we do about them in, in how we choose to 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 do things and to move forward and i think you're a great example of this as well like thanks with write, writing the book and uh, sharing this perspective uh and your your own struggle i think this is this is quite amazing no thank you it's it, it's what i found helping other people to be very therapeutic i mean there's and i i will also add this there's a very bad tendency if you have some sort of mental illness, you get so inwardly focused. All you can focus on is your own pain and your own feelings, and then you ruminate, and then that just, again, you, you cycle down. The more you can focus on other people when you're depressed, as difficult as it is, the better you'll be. You need to try to change your focus, and you need to force yourself to think in different and maybe uncomfortable ways, and that's something that was really helpful to me, and that's, I think, why channeling my energy into redemption was something that was really helpful to me and hopefully helpful to other people as well. Then. Mm. And this is a really good tip actually, and really practical. Like mm-hmm. if we are in a situation when, when we feel uh, a- anxious or depressed or um, we were just in a, in a bad place, we can try to get out of ourselves and our mind and our head and look at other people and, uh, find ways of uh, helping, of doing mm-hmm. something 
for uh, for other people, maybe even yeah. for people that are in a similar situation uh, to ours. And mm-hmm. we can do simple things, I think, like mm-hmm. even just meet someone or smile or yeah. I don't know, do something simple. But uh, it can be quite a lot for them, right? Well, it, it's there's actually studies that show that if you go volunteering, it can make you feel better. Just mm-hmm. like volunteering at a local soup kitchen or something like that, that can actually improve your mood and help alleviate depression. So serving other people, doing something to get you out of your own head, that's great and that's useful and necessary. Yeah, and I love, uh, we, we had the, a little talking uh, be- before the, the actual interview and I love your perspective on Uh, the politicians that you've been interacting yeah. with and it's yep. really refreshing I, i was telling mike that mike that uh we have kind of a, a big problem with corruption here in romania and we laughed at our president cheers america <laughs> <laughs> and uh and mike was was telling me that Uh, the politicians that uh, he knows, and uh, I also told him that he's like I can feel that he had has a good heart and uh, great intentions. Okay. And um, the, the politicians that he knows, they are actually in it for for the people and for yep. making a difference. And I think it this is really amazing. And when you talk, when you think about gratitude, like there are people that this is what they do. Like they have your best interest at, at mm-hmm. mind and at heart. And I think this is quite an amazing thing of uh, our modern society to have people that think um, about the, like the bigger picture of what's going on and they're doing their best to, to help improve everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I say, I, I've been, I've, it's been very, an experience for which I'm actually grateful so far to see that the vast majority of people, even those who I really disagree with, I look at them, I go, okay, I know what you're doing and why I disagree with you totally, but I know you're trying to do what you think to be the right thing. And that's, that's a relief. That really is to know that though I disagree with them on everything in some cases that their intentions are good. So mm-hmm. I'm grateful for that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, Uh, I'm also like I'm really grateful for our mayor, for instance, that he that I know that he's doing like lots of amazing things to make this city uh, really better and better and solve Great. all all of the problems that that we have. And it's pretty amazing that honestly, it's it's kind of cool that I don't have to do anything almost like. <laughs> uh, but the the cool thing is that he's open for communication as well and. Mm-hmm this is like a really good balance and I'm seeing things happening and um, yeah, I'm really grateful even though like it's for everyone. But if I'm like thinking about myself, I am benefiting from that as well as personally. And that, that that is really beautiful. So by the way, what are you doing? Like, like as a state representative, like I'm really curious to. Well, biggest, I mean, everybody, there's so much that you can do. The two biggest things that I talk about as a state representative are education and mental health. The personal connection with mental health at this point is obvious. Um, I've really concentrated my legislative efforts on a few pieces of legislation that are anti-suicide, trying to help college kids who get access to mental health care, as well as first responders. We know that Here, our police, our firemen, our EMSs, those who deal in the uh, coroner's office, really suffer from a lot of trauma and are at a much greater risk of, unfortunately, attempting or completing suicide. We want to make sure they get all the help that they need. I've got a bill I'm working on with a Republican member of the other party to try to make it easier for mothers who are in the state's early intervention program. That's a program for poor or at-risk mothers to get screened and then treated for postpartum depression, a major, major problem among new mothers. Um, education is, a, is another one. That's a broader one here. But I live in and represent a very poor urban school district. The school funding system in Pennsylvania is just horrifically broken. And I'm trying to work to not only put more money into it, but to make it more fair and make it so that my kids get the same great education as and have the access to all the same resources as the kids in the wealthier school districts next door. And there's, I, I could go on four days about the things that I'm working on. But in a nutshell, those are the two big ones that I talk about the most. Mm, I love it. And another mm. thing that you said before uh, going live that I, that I thought was amazing is that um, the people that you serve 
aren't uh, like the number of them isn't too big yeah. for you to not be able to to uh, interact with them personally quite a lot and i think yeah. this is this is awesome like uh, the fact that you you care so much and you want to be with uh, with the people there and to know their problems and their struggles and um and another thing that i wanted to mention that i think is is very important about what you just said about postpartum uh, mm -hmm. depression is yep. that these things influence like generations like for instance you if you if you uh if you as a child like in my case let's say uh, if my mom would suffer or would have suffered from postpartum depression I, as a child, would be influenced by that, and I would have maybe some traumas or some uh, some kinds of issues that have to do with the fact that she went through that. And getting help on that, like uh, really deep level, um, I think can help can have a really big impact uh, in like many many years to come. And I think this is amazing. Of course, like education, like and that's yeah. It's no just hugely, hugely important, and I, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a big, it's a big. Pennsylvania has one of the biggest gaps in the country uh, between the richest and the poorest school district. And I represent one of the poorest school districts in, in the entire state. So that's that's a big one here. And you, and on the postpartum part, you totally hit the nail on the head. I mean, postpartum depression affects every generation involved, include especially the mother and the child. We want to make sure that we're giving both of them the life they deserve. This is wonderful. Okay, so uh, we are nearing the end of our time together. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, who are you grateful for in your life right now? Uh, a lot. But I mean, the, the first two are the obvious ones. My wife, her name is Brenna. She's wonderful. She puts up with me. Um, and she's <laughs> helped me through countless dark spells. Um, I have a seven-year-old named Oren and a little boy and a five-year-old little girl named Ayla. Um, and like any... Like any good dad, I, I, which I, I think I am, they are the light of my lives. Um, and I'm lucky. I have my parents are here. Uh, my in-laws are here. They're in relatively good health. I love my in-laws like I love my parents. I have wonderful staff that keeps my head on straight. Um, and con my constituents, people who have continuously said, we're going to send you back and let you keep representing us. And I had a pretty, I had somebody run against me pretty hard in the last election. And I won more than two to one. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve them. And I hope to be deserving of the faith that they've placed. In me. So hmm. that's it in a nutshell. Big wow. nutshell. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, and I love that. And I think that that says quite a lot about you the fact uh, that they, they keep reelecting you and yeah. they they keep believing in in you and and in your work and i think this is really beautiful so um in the end let, let us know a little bit about your book when sure. uh when it will go out yeah. where where we can we find it and everything mm -hmm. absolutely and and i can send you a link too maybe if you can if, if you can put it in the description that's perfect um and if not again the name is redemption my name is mike flossberg you can search it on amazon or just google it Um, it is available on June 5th. You can pre-order it now uh, and it'll be available. It's for $4, $3.99. It'll be $6 once it comes out on electronic format. Not sure about the print format yet, but you can get it on Amazon. And again, uh, Redemption is a book about depression, anxiety, and saving the world. And I think it's an interesting read no matter what you suffer from or what your interests are. Wonderful, wonderful. By the way, how much time did it take you to, to write it? It took... That's a good question. I'm going to say about nine months or so to write it, another nine months to edit it, and then another year plus to go through the edit to to get it to find a publisher and then go through their editing process. So it was this was a three year journey that'll be coming to fruition in about uh, two a little more right now a little more than two weeks. So I'm I I can't wait to see it and to actually you know to, to hold a printed copy of it. It's like a baby. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited. Yeah, and I know it's it's a quite a long process, and uh, that, yeah. that that that's why I ask because it's like we value things more if we understand how much work and how much passion it it, it was yeah. put in it, uh, and in them. Yeah, I love that. A lot okay, of work. so um, go find the book, um, and I think like 
if you want to read fiction, uh, you can mm-hmm. read a, a kind of fiction that is actually helpful and it's actually healing. And I think this is a brilliant idea. Like for for the type of person that I am, this is like the perfect perfect combination of a book, and uh, I love that very much. So well, thank, thank you. you, thank you so much, Mike, for for being here with us, for sharing so many amazing insights, and for sharing your passion and your enthusiasm with us. Well, then thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for your work in helping people try to find the good in their lives. I appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to our weekly podcast. Help us reach our goal of inspiring 100,000 people by sharing this podcast with your loved ones, with your Facebook friends. And if you loved this episode, please write a review on iTunes. My name is Anthony Capazzoli. I am the host of the Dismantle Life podcast and I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict after nearly 40 years of addiction. I've been clean and sober for nearly four years and work hard to help others find recovery. Join me each episode to learn from my sober superhero guests and how they went from the darkness of addiction into the sunlight of recovery. Dismantled Life can be found on Digitent Podcasts, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.